Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Edward Archer. I'm an obesity theorist at the Office of Energetics at the Nutrition Obesity Research Center at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And we're here to speak about your upcoming paper, The Childhood Obesity Epidemic as a Result of Non-Genetic Evolution, The Maternal Resources Hypothesis. It's going to be in the January 2015 uh, Mayo Clinic Proceedings Journal. Why don't you tell us about your paper? Right. First, I'd like to thank my colleagues, my esteemed colleagues and critics, who truly helped me improve this paper, as well as the editors and staff at the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Um, it's quite simply, stated simply, uh, my paper is perhaps the most comprehensive theory of obesity that's ever been presented. And I link the social environmental changes over the past century to the epidemiologic changes that led to a tipping point and the evolutionary consequences of that tipping point. So you mentioned these evolutionary consequences and a tipping point. Yes. Beginning in the 1950s, uh, mothers became increasingly sedentary, increasingly inactive, and increasingly heavier. And this altered their metabolism during pregnancy. So more and more energy was driven towards the fetus. So the babies were born larger and a little bit fatter. And each generation, ch children became more and more inactive. So when they matured, they en ended up having children that were a little bit more inactive and a little heavier. Over multiple generations, eventually reached a tipping point where the adiposity and the inactivity were so great that it eventually reached the obesity epidemic that we have now. So this could come across as controversial. Are you blaming mothers here? No, not at all. Um, the catchphrase is, is evolution is the cause and moms are the cure, especially active mothers. Uh, it took multiple generations for us to reach that tipping point and we can easily reverse it in one or two generations of active mothers. Mothers have to know that when they are pregnant, um, their activity, how they spend their day, determines not only their health and the health of their unborn child, but if that child's a female, it, it alters and impacts the metabolism of the eggs that are developing the fetus. So a mother's physical activity patterns during her pregnancy affect three generations, and there are strong evolutionary consequences to this. So you talk about mom, but what about genes and the genes of the father? But what about paternal effects? Well, um, nature is always discriminated against, discriminated against men. Uh, we don't have a uterus. So we are unable to control the most important nine months of an individual's development. All health trajectories begin in the womb, and men don't have one. So nature has kind of discriminated against us in that. But nature does provide us with genes. But what I argue in my paper is that the environmental effects of the interuterine environment, the environmental insult, the metabolic insult that is done from the confluence of insulin resistance of pregnancy with the insulin resistance of inactivity overwhelms any genetic effect, which means put any human genome in that interuterine environment with where the mother is obese and inactive, and you will produce a child predisposed to type 2 diabetes, obesity, and cancer. Wow. Well, what about nutrition? Well, nutrition, nutrition obviously is important, but if we, if, we think of, if we think about the effects of nutrition, ultimately food is necessary. In order for us to, to develop an obesity epidemic, we had to have food in the environment. But uh, I think the greatest lie in public health is we are what we eat. It's not. We are what our body does with what we eat. And the jargony term for that is nutrient partitioning. So, for example, if an individual runs a marathon, or sits on the sofa watching a marathon, the individual sitting on the sofa will partition their food very differently than the individual that ran that marathon. And the most de important determinants are your body composition, your physical activity, and your hormonal status. Now your body composition is determined in utero by your mom's body composition and physical activity during her pregnancy. And that's the evolutionary consequence. So the second is your physical activity levels. The third would be hormonal status. Ask any postmenopausal female if when she eats that cake, does it go right to her thighs? It's somewhat true. I mean, that actually is nutrient partitioning because her hormonal status, she's lost the anabolic stimulus. So that changes, that allows her to develop more muscle mass rather than more fat mass. So nutrition's important, but ultimately it's not the final answer. Really? Even with unhealthy diets? Well, when someone uses the term unhealthy, it tends to be very vague. Uh, we're eating more fruits and vegetables now than we did 30 years ago. There's no question on this. And the last C um, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's biochemical analysis demonstrated that 80% of our population is not at risk for any of the deficiencies, any of the biomarkers that they tested for. A hundred years ago, we had tens of thousands of people dying from the diseases of deficiency. So now we don't have the diseases of deficiency. We don't have the risk for deficiencies. So our population is incredibly healthy. Women of childbearing age, 90% of women of childbearing age, are not at risk for deficiency. 
of iron. So they don't have anemia, they don't have risk for deficiencies. So, and their folate status has increased 50% over the past 10 years. So my argument against that would be, we have the healthiest food supply in the history of mankind. And when we actually quantify people's physical activity, somewhere between 75 and 95% of our population are not meeting the minimum federal guidelines for physical activity. But 80% of our population is not at risk for any nutri nutrient deficiencies. So when it comes to nutrition or physical activity, what's more important? Let's fix the pathology, and the pathology is physical activity. We're not doing enough of it. Excellent. You talked about many things. Is there anything else you'd like to add in regards to your paper? Well, I think, as I said when I started off, it's probably the most comprehensive and controversial theory of childhood obesity that's ever been put forth. And most importantly, I really have to thank my critics, because many individuals criticized the paper as I was developing it, and they helped improve it. And they allowed me to answer many questions that people put forth, such as the genetic effects the effects of nutrition, the effects of fast food, and the social environmental changes that we've had over the past hundred years. Because these have led to mothers being increasingly physically inactive and fathers being physically inactive. And as I spoke earlier about the prenatal and postnatal effects, um, fathers have very little control over the prenatal environment. They do have a significant control in the later years. If you have an active father, chances are you'll be more of an active child. But unfortunately, the, well, maybe not unfortunately, but the vast majority of caregivers are women. So not only do they control the prenatal environment, they control the postnatal environment. And if they use a TV as a babysitter, and it's understandable why they would. If they're working two jobs, if they're a single mom with three kids, it's really easy just to put the little boy or girl in front of a television. But the reasons that is beneficial to the mom is the same reason it's, it's de detrimental to the child, because it captures their attention and it keeps them still. So yes, it keeps them out of trouble, but every calorie that doesn't go to build muscle and bone goes to building fat mass. And if it's a female child, when she hits puberty, she'll actually increase that fat mass exponentially, and then she'll pass on her obesity to her child. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www mayocliniproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about health care at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.